So far we have discussed uh, diatomic molecules. Now let us expand the scope of our discussion a little bit and now we want to talk about uh, not necessarily uh, diatomic, not necessarily linear molecules. We want to talk about a little bigger molecules and while doing that uh, we know that molecules have their own characteristic shape, right. So this is something that we have studied uh, Gillespie and Nyholm's approach of valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. There we know that we have an AB2 kind of molecule then it is going to be linear. If it is AB3 where A is one atom central atom and uh, B is uh, another atom you can say pendant atom then we will get a trigonal planar molecule AB4 tetrahedral AB5 trigonal biplanar uh, trigonal bipyramid sorry AB6 octahedral right. Of course these are all regular solids uh, regular molecules and these are all molecules in which you have a central uh, atom. Okay, holds very nicely for metal complexes for example. And the reason why molecules have these shapes, please remember because very often by mistake we put the cart before the horse, the reason why molecules have this shape is valence shell electron pair repulsion has to be minimized. So if you have uh, a situation in which uh, you have two bonds, right? this is one bond, this is another bond. Then uh, if they are like this and suppose there is no other lone pair or anything, there will be some repulsion. Then what will happen? They will try to open out, open out, open out. When they are at 180 degrees to each other, then this repulsion between what we can call bond pair of electrons is minimum. That is why AB2, so two bonds means what? I have central A atom, a B atom here and a B atom here. This AB2 is going to be a linear molecule. Okay. What happens if I have a trigonal planar molecule? Unfortunately, I do not have a third pen, so I will just use this. So, trigonal planar again you have say three bonds, you put them at some angle, something like this, hold it like a pyramid, they are going to repel, 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 and finally, if these bonds are all equal, equal, if you remember, we are talking about AB3 kind of molecules, which means all the uh, bond pairs are. Uh, equivalent. Then the repulsion will be minimum when they are all in a plane and the angle between two is 120 degrees. So generally when I go to class uh, I do something which I have not been able to do today because well uh, what I do in class is uh, I take balloons, I blow up balloons and uh, I tie them up and I show that when you tie up two balloons hold like this you will always get a straight line right two balloons like this. Then if I tie two more balloons and wrap them together in front of your eyes you get a tetrahedron yeah balloons are balloons there is no hybridization or nothing. So uh, what holds for balloons also holds for electron clouds right in air in the balloon that wants to stay in a comfortable manner. Similarly electron clouds want to stay in a comfortable manner. So it is important to understand that VSAPR is essentially a steric effect. Okay. Lone pairs occupy more volume because they are not bound at one end. So lone pair bond pair repulsion, lone pair lone pair repulsion is maximum, lone pair bond pair repulsion follows, bond pair bond pair repulsion is minimum. But whatever repulsion it is you want to minimize it and that is why the molecules take up whatever shape they take up. Okay. So unfortunately uh, right now we are in lockdown and uh, I do not know where to buy balloons and then I have to blow all of them up by myself do not have anybody to help so you do it yourself. Please blow up balloons you might have seen it in parties and all when they tie up balloons they always tie in pairs and then they roll them together and what the shape you get is a tetrahedron. Why do you get a tetrahedron? Because a tetrahedron is the minimum uh, bond pair bond pair repulsion geometry for an AB4 kind of molecule. Similarly if you roll two more balloons there you will get an octahedron okay, and so on and so forth. You burst one of the uh, balloons in octahedron, it will become a trigonal bipyramid TBP in front of your eyes. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot show that to you now, but I encourage you to please do the experiment yourself and see it is a lot of fun. You can demonstrate it to even 
it is 5 year old kid and they will be amazed and they will be amused and impressed and uh, well it amuses me every time I do it. So, I hope it will amuse you as well right. So, this is the crux of the matter molecules have certain shapes because of VACPR they want to minimize the uh, lone pair lone pair lone pair bond pair bond pair bond pair repulsions. The problem is this if I want to build say a valence bond description of such a molecule how do I do it because I have to use orbitals that are there in the uh, atoms right atoms that constitute the molecules how do I do it because for example I want to make I want to talk about this AB3 kind of molecule BF3 let us say boron has 2s orbital and 2p orbital it does not have orbitals uh, which have angles of 120 degrees between each other. So, what do I do? To what, what I do is that I invoke hybridization which means I mix orbitals and I make new orbitals which gives us the suitable geometry required to minimize the uh, lone pair bond pair bond pair bond pair etc. repulsions. So, uh, please do not say that uh, BF3 is trigonal planar because it uses sp2 hybridization it is the other way around bf3 uses sp2 hybrid orbitals of boron because it has to be trigonal planar being an ab3 molecule and that is determined by vscpr right but perhaps i have also put the card before the horse a little bit because out of the blue i started talking about hybridization and hybrid orbitals without telling you what hybridization is and what am i talking about well uh, this is the more formal uh, discussion. The handsome gentleman you see here is Linus Pauling who has uh, been one of the founding fathers of the field of uh, chemical bonding especially. And uh, Pauling as you might know got two Nobel prizes one in chemistry one in peace. Very uh, interesting life is on a lot of things. Uh, he wrote this book on chemical bonding which for a long time was a textbook and now it has become a classic. Uh, you can read it very easily I recommend that you read Pauling's book. And Pauling also proposed this vitamin C theory by which he said that vitamin C is uh, something that protects you from a lot of, di a lot of diseases. He also tried to work in uh, the structure of biomolecules uh, very illustrious career extremely significant contribution to science as long as human civilization exists in this present form Pauling's name will not be forgotten. So, hybridization was one of the concepts that was introduced by Linus Pauling. So, what he said is that uh, we need more effective bonding. More effective bonding means uh, in this context we need to minimize these bond pair bond pair or whatever repulsions. To do that since we do not have suitable orbitals we have to produce suitable orbitals by taking linear combinations of atomic orbitals ok. So, uh, this is uh, a schematic energy diagram of 2s and 2p orbitals remember in a multi electron atoms. I do not remember whether, whether I said it in as many words, but what happens in multi electron atoms is that uh, because of shielding uh, 2s and 2p electrons now have different energies. You might remember that asp these are all atomic orbitals and orbitals as you better remember by now me having said it so many times are one electron wave functions. So, as long as it is a one electron system uh, 2s and 2p orbitals actually have the same energy, but uh, in a multi electron atom many electron atom the extent of shielding of 2s and 2p electron is not same that is why 2p electrons have higher energy than 2s electron. So, what Pauling said is that let us mix a required number of orbitals and we can mix them in different ways. We can think that we have applied a field which induces mixing right. So, let us say we have mixed one orbital let us say 2 p z orbital generally uh, what we do is we take z to be a unique axis. Let us say we have done mixing of 2 s and 2 p orbital and we have made 2 orbitals one is gamma 2 s plus beta 2 p z the uh, sorry alpha 2 s plus beta 2 p z the other is gamma 2 s plus delta 2 p z all right. So, now uh, these are hybrid orbitals and the picture that I am showing you here 
is a general picture and sometimes people actually contest this picture because we are fixated upon thinking of equivalent hybrid orbitals I will come to that. But please believe me for now that this is this most general picture in which you can apply some kind of a field do something or require the molecule to undergo hybridization and uh, make hybrid orbitals right. Uh, these are coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Depending on the relative magnitudes of alpha, beta, gamma, delta the energies of the two orbitals are going to be more or less or equal to each other. Okay. So, uh, well more about that shortly. See this coefficients depend on field strength and square of a coefficient is contribution of the atomic orbital and hybrid orbital. So, we have discussed linear combination only already we are going to discuss linear combination in the later stage of this course as well. So, what we know is that when we take linear combination and uh, take mod square the contribution comes from mod square of the coefficient. Okay. So, see uh, in this orbital that I have drawn as lower in energy mod alpha square or alpha square if alpha is real that is going to give me the S contribution. Mod beta square or beta square if beta is real is going to give me the relative contribution of 2 pz. Similarly here gamma square or mod gamma square will give me the contribution of 2s mod delta square or delta square will give me contribution of 2 pz in this hybrid orbital. Now suppose mod alpha square is equal to mod gamma square that means the orbitals are equivalent that means they have the uh, same contribution from s orbital same contribution for p orbital. Okay. As you understand energy of the orbital will depend on since we are mixing now orbitals uh, or wave functions that have little different energy from each other. Uh, if the contribution of 2s is more then the energy of the hybrid orbital will be closer to that of 2s that is lower in energy. If contribution of 2s is less then the contribution of p is more we say p character is more or p contribution is more then that orbital will be closer in energy to uh, p orbitals. So, that would be non equivalent, but if what we have shown here mod alpha square is equal to mod gamma square mod beta square is equal to mod delta square then you have equivalent hybrid orbitals. So, the hybrid orbitals that we have used many times right from class 11 or class 12 sp2 sp3 sp these are all equivalent hybrid orbitals but it is not necessarily that they always have to be equivalent. So, in our discussion we will also talk about hybrid orbitals that are non equivalent we actually encountered them in say water okay. orbitals used to uh, used in bond pair you need two such orbitals are equivalent of one kind orbitals for lone pair are equivalent of another kind the two types are not equivalent to each other. Okay. So, this is the most general picture there is no need to think that hybrid orbitals must necessarily always be equivalent. If they are not equivalent then you cannot use notations like your uh, sp, sp2, sp3 and so on and so forth that is all. Okay. Now another important thing to remember is that hybrid orbitals are orthonormal to each other. Okay. We make them mix them in such a way and we are actually going to do some calculations. So, this will become clearer when we do that we mix them in such a way that they form an orthonormal set. So, take sp orbitals the 2 sp orbitals are actually orthogonal to each other and they are normalized by themselves that is how we calculate the coefficients in the first place uh, more about that when we come to it. Now let us start talking about uh, the first kind of hybrid uh, well equivalent hybridization that we want to discuss and that is sp or hybridization. Okay, how do I decide whether I want sp or sp2 or sp3 rule of thumb number of hybrid orbitals is equal to number of participating atomic orbitals. And uh, so, if you need two equivalent bonds like you do in acetylene then I need one s orbital s will always be there I need only one p orbital to mix with s orbital so I would sp. If you want uh, 3 what did I say did I say 1 if I have 2 bonds 2 equivalent bonds like in acetylene like in acetylene part was correct 
then we will do sp hybridization because 1 s orbital 1 p orbital makes to give you 2 sp hybrid orbitals and how they look we will come to that. If I want to talk about BF3 then I need 3 uh, equivalent hybrid orbitals for the 3 sigma bonds right. So, then I need 3 orbitals 1 is s I need 2 of the p's. If I want to talk about methane I need 4 orbitals for sigma bonds 1 s and all the 3 p's like that ok. Now, one thing that we should mention here and this becomes most important because we are also going to talk about molecular orbital theory and we have already we already know about overlap integral from our discussion of your uh, well did not take the name overlap integral then uh, discussion of many electron atoms. Uh, please do not forget that S and P orbitals are of the same atom. So, overlap integral and all those things does not uh, do not even arise ok. Now, let us go ahead. So, what we need is 2 equivalent hybrid orbitals of same energy and shape directions of, of course have to be at 180 degrees to each other because we want to handle AB2 kind of systems ok. What do I do? This is what I need I have an S orbital and I have a P orbital what I am drawing here is your uh, constant probability surfaces not really orbitals. So, when we hybridize I want to hybridize in such a way that I will get one orbital pointing this way the other orbital pointing that way. So, I want a major lobe on one side, I want a minor lobe on the other side and this black dot is a nucleus. Please note that the nucleus is within the minor lobe. This is another mistake that we sometimes make. We place the nucleus at the node, it is at the minor lobe, uh, minor lobe and I will convince you that the nucleus is uh, in the minor lobe ok. So, the it is very simple. I have only 2 orbitals here S and P. And when I combine essentially I need linear combination. So, when I have 2 functions I can take 2 kinds of combinations 1 with minus 1 with plus and then I want to normalize it right. Uh, I said earlier that the hybrid orbitals have to form an orthonormal set. So, I take psi s plus psi p psi s minus psi p 1 by root 2 is normalization constant. Please check for yourself that psi 2 is normalized psi 1 is normalized not very difficult to see because after all psi s and psi p by themselves are normalized. So, what is your uh, integral psi 2 square and uh, should I write x? No, ok, I will write psi 2 square d tau ok, but I will write it in a little shorthand notation that will be equal to integral psi s square d tau plus integral psi p square d tau plus integral I am not even writing the constants all right. Oh no I, I think I should. So, 1 by 2 no this is 1 by 2 and this is going to be psi s psi p d tau this is a 1 by 2 here and I hope you understood what I did. This is a plus b, right? So, what is a plus b whole square? That is a square plus 2ab plus b square, right? So, this is a square, this is 2ab, this is b square. But now we are talking about not any a and b, we are talking about orbitals. So, now see this integral here, what is this equal to? Integral psi a square that is equal to 1 because psi s by itself is normalized. So, this thing becomes half. Second one again psi p is normalized this thing becomes half and here psi s and psi p remember are orthogonal to each other. So, this integral will be equal to 0 and this is what I said do not get confused with overlap integral we will get something like this uh, later on when, when we talk about MO ok. Well, uh, even in VBT we have discussed a little bit. So, uh, we will do not think this is overlap integral. Overlap integral arises only when there are 2 nuclei here there is only 1 nucleus. So, this is 0, this is 1, this is 1, this is half, this is half. So, half plus half is equal to 1. So, we have proven that psi 2 is normalized. Similarly, you can show that psi 1 is normalized as well. And what happens if I try to work out integral psi 1 psi 2 d tau psi s plus psi p this is psi s minus psi p and we have 1 by root 2 1 by root 2 that will be 1 by 2 integral psi s square d tau minus I can take this outside the bracket integral psi p square 
d tau. So, now we know this is 1, this is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. So, we have proved that psi 1 and psi 2 actually are orthogonal to each other. Linear geometry with hybridized atom at the center. This is what we achieve when we use sp hybridization. But we have unfinished business. I told you that uh, the nucleus actually resides in the minor lobe which means that the way I have drawn it here the minor lobes are actually overlapping with each other. I should actually prove it before we close this discussion. So now see uh, contribution from s what is the contribution from s half contribution of p is also half. Okay. So, it is an equal mix contribution is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 50 percent s character, 50 percent p character. How did I get half? 1 by root 2 square, remember coefficient square. Okay. Now, let us think about the contours for the moment. This is the contour of sp hybrid orbital and I show you how we get it. Uh, this is where the nucleus is. As I said, the uh, nucleus is actually engulfed by the minor lobe. Um, Somehow this does not work on my computer, but if you go to this link, I have not checked it in a while, I hope it is still there. Uh, you can see very nicely how a 2s and a 2p orbital morph into uh, giving you this sp hybrid orbital and the reason why you get a node here and the reason why you get uh, this nucleus engulfed by the minor lobe is that you are working with 2s orbital and 2s orbital itself has a node. Right? So, let us see if you understand that a little better uh, from here. Uh, now, we go back to very early part, not very early part, sometime I do not remember module 15, 16, where we had shown you the uh, plots of orbitals against R. As I said, these are made by Professor Shashidhar about 20, 21 years ago. So, this is the plot of your 2s orbital, right? 2s orbital has a radial node. Goes through, goes through 0 changes sign and remains negative uh, and becomes 0 asymptotically. So, this is a radial node and I had shown you the 3D picture um, actually I had shown you a prettier 3D picture than what you show this black and white picture that I show you here and this is what it looks like. And you also know that uh, this is what the plot of this 2pz orbital would be 3D plot psi on one axis x and z on the other two axes. Right? We have a hill, we have a trough, we have a valley. Now let us do something, let us take a section, right? let us take a razor blade and cut it from the top. Huh? Let us take a section of this 2s orbital, let us also take a section of this 2pz orbital. Okay? You understand what a section is, I am sure you take a, uh, what should I say, um, take a watermelon and cut it, if you cut it this way you see a cross section that is an oval, you cut it this way you see a cross section that is about roughly a circle. Similarly, we are going to take a cross section and this is what we see. This here is your 2s, right? peak at the center falls off, goes to the node, becomes negative, then goes to a minimum and becomes 0 asymptotically. Same thing on the other side. What about 2pz? plus slope here then at the nucleus we have a node. That is a very important difference between 2s and 2p. 2s has maximum at the nucleus, 2p has maximum uh, sorry 0 node at the nucleus and there it changes sign. Now uh, do not forget the question we are trying to answer. We are trying to answer the question why are we saying that uh, the nucleus is engulfed by the minor lobe. So now look at the uh, periphery of the nucleus and let me acknowledge Professor Sandeep Kar, my colleague who actually drew this picture and uh, showed us that this is a good way to explain this. This picture I have not seen it any in any textbook. All right. So now see near the nucleus what is the value of 2pz? Close to nucleus it is 0. What is the value of 2s near the nucleus? It is very high. So I hope you will agree with me that in the immediate vicinity of the nucleus it is the value of the 2s orbital that is going to predominate. As you go further away 2pz can take over. So in the immediate vicinity the uh, value of 2s orbital is going to predominate. What happens if you go far, far away from nucleus on this side or that side? If you go to that this side you see 2pz is plus 
and 2s is negative they cancel each other you have destructive interference. So, you eventually reach 0. If you go to this side then both are negative. So, there is constructive interference. So, your minor lobe is here and I hope I have been able to convince you that all around the nucleus it is going to be plus sign which according to this is the uh, sign of 2s orbital uh, near the nucleus and that is a sign of the minor lobe. Usually minor lobe is showing with minus, but do not forget that that is just convention we replace psi by minus psi nothing changes ok, psi square mod psi square remains the same. So, uh, this is what gives you this kind of major lobe minor lobe and the nucleus is within the minor lobe. I hope you have been convinced that this is how it happens alright. So, how does bonding take place? You have two sp orbitals overlapping like this and the remaining p orbitals are available for pi bonding. That is why in acetylene you have 1 sigma orbital then 1 pi orbital like this 1 pi orbital like this say pz is used for sigma is for hybridization which is used for sigma bonding px and py or I should show like this px and py are used for pi bonding right that is what we have discussed about linear geometry next in the next class we will talk about trigonal geometry and sp2 hybrid orbitals.